law in evolving always because the society faces new challenges accordingly law has to be responsive. So, this international humanitarian law is also not an exception to this general rule. The Geneva conventions and customary international law relating to international humanitarian law is evolved as we have seen in the earlier lessons for more than one century. So, in the 21st century also the international community because of the development of new arms, new system of attacks, some challenges are posed to the existing international humanitarian law. So, this will be the subject matter of lesson number 5 under the caption current challenges. IHRS evolved considerably adapting to new circumstances, societal norms and technologies. Yet, it takes time for treaties and custom to catch up. Some of the main challenges IHL faces today are the complex nature of contemporary armed conflict, the applicability to new technologies, sexual violence in conflict. Accordingly, we will be addressing these three issues in this lesson. Contemporary armed conflict since the adoption of the 1949 Geneva Conventions, there has been a sharp rise in the number of civilians who participate in the armed conflict. These are several causes including conflicts being conducted increasingly in urban areas. The rise in conflicts involving non-state armed groups and the increased use of private military and security companies. International humanitarian law has responded by for instance introducing new categories of combatants and expanding the law on non-international armed conflicts. But the asymmetry of contemporary armed conflict with well equipped state forces on one side and insurgents, guerrillas and armed terrorists on the other side. Asymmetric conflicts. An asymmetric conflict is war between belligerents whose relative military power differs significantly or whose strategy or tactics differ significantly. Inequality in arms indeed significant disparity between belligerents has become a prominent feature of various contemporary armed conflicts. As a structural characteristic of modern day warfare, asymmetric conflict structures have repercussions on the application of fundamental principles of international humanitarian law. Moreover, military imbalances of this scope evidently carry incentives for the inferior party to level out its inferiority by circumventing accepted rules of warfare. Where state forces are fighting non-state armed groups, the well equipped state forces tend to make an effort to comply with international humanitarian law, whereas the insurgents guerrillas or armed terrorists with fewer resources often camouflage themselves among the civilian population. Non-state armed groups have little incentive to respect international humanitarian law, not least because state assert the right to target them anywhere and to detain them without trial. International armed conflicts and non-international armed conflicts. The increasing complicity of armed conflicts has given rise to discussions over the notion and typology of armed conflicts including whether the international humanitarian law classification of conflicts into international and non-international armed conflict is sufficient to encompass the types of 
armed conflicts taking place today. New technologies. As emerging technologies of warfare, notably those relying on information, technology and robotics often brought complex challenges. Although new technologies of warfare are not specifically regulated by the international humanitarian law treaties, their development and employment in armed conflict does not occur in a legal vacuum. As with all weapon systems, they must be capable of being used in compliance with international humanitarian law and in particular its rules on the conduct of hostilities. The responsibility for ensuring this rests first and foremost with each state that is developing these new technologies of warfare. In accordance with Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1, each state party is required to determine whether the employment of a new weapon means or method of warfare that it studies, develops, acquires or adopts would in some or all circumstances be prohibited by international law. Legal reviews of new weapons including new technologies of warfare are a critical measure for states to ensure respect for international humanitarian law. More specifically, they are a way to ensure that a state's armed forces are capable of conducting hostilities in accordance with its international obligations and that new weapons are not employed prematurely under conditions in which respect for international humanitarian law cannot be guaranteed. However, despite this legal requirement and large number of states that develop or acquire new weapon systems every year, only a small number are known to have procedures in place to carry out legal reviews of new weapons. Although it is undisputed that new weapons must be capable of being used in accordance with international humanitarian law rules governing the conduct of hostilities, difficulties in interpreting and applying these rules to new technologies of warfare may arise in view of their unique characteristics and intended and expected circumstances of their use and their foreseeable humanitarian consequences. Ultimately, these challenges may raise a question of whether existing law is sufficiently clear or whether there is a need to clarify international humanitarian law or develop new rules to deal with these challenges. Cyber warfare and autonomous weapon systems are but two of the new technologies of warfare that raise a range of legal, ethical and humanitarian issues, only some of which are briefly mentioned and discussed below. Wide array of new technologies has entered the modern battlefield. Cyber space has opened up a potentially new war fighting domain. Remote controlled weapons systems such as drones are increasingly being used by parties to armed conflicts. Automated weapon systems are also on the rise and certain autonomous systems such as combat robots are being considered for future use on the battlefield. There can be no doubt that international humanitarian law applies to these new weapons and employment of new technology in warfare. However, these new means and methods of warfare pose legal and practical challenges in terms of ensuring their use complies with existing international humanitarian law norms and also that due regard is given to the foreseeable humanitarian impact of their use. But the challenges include how to define a cyber attack under additional protocol 1, the related issue of whether cyber operations that did not injure civilians or damage civilian property were permissible and when to attribute a cyber operation to a state. So now in turn we will discuss what is cyber warfare.
The expression cyber warfare appears to have been used by different people to mean different things. The term is used here to refer to means and methods of warfare that consist of cyber operations amounting to or conducted in the context of an armed conflict within the meaning of international humanitarian law. There is only one cyberspace shared by military and civilian users and everything is interconnected. The key challenges are to ensure that attackers are directed against military objectives only and that constant care is taken to spare the civilian population and civilian infrastructure. Furthermore, the expected incidental civilian losses and damage must not be excessive in relation to concrete and direct military advantage anticipated by the cyber attack. If these conditions cannot be met, the attack must not be launched. The manual appropriately recalls in this regard that collateral damage consists of both direct and indirect effects and that any anticipated indirect effect must be factored into the proportionality assessment during planning and execution of an attack. A point highly relevant in cyberspace. These challenges underline the importance of states being extremely cautious when resorting to cyber attacks. We will move on to now autonomous weapon systems. During the past 15 years, there has been a dramatic increase in the development and use of robotic systems by armed forces. In particular, various armed unmanned systems that operate in the air, on land and in water including the ICs. The gradual increase in the sophistication of military machinery and in the physical distance of soldiers from the battlefield is a process as old as war itself. However, recent developments in robotics and computing combined with military operational demands raise the prospect of reducing or removing altogether direct human control over weapon systems and the use of force. This paradigm shift is not a sudden development but is the result of the incremental increase over time of autonomy in weapon system specifically in the critical functions of selecting and attacking targets. Some weapon systems in use today have autonomy in their critical functions. These include air and missile defense weapon systems, ground vehicle active protection weapon system and border or perimeter weapon systems sometimes called sentry guns as well as loitering munitions and armed underwater vehicles. Many of these weapon systems have autonomous modes meaning they can be switched on to operate autonomously for a fixed periods of time. Most tend to be highly constrained in the task they have used for the types of targets they attack, vehicles and other objects rather than the personnel. And the circumstances in which they are used, importantly it seems that most of these existing weapons are overseen in real time by human operator. However, in future autonomous weapon systems might be given more freedom of action to determine their targets to operate outside tightly constrained spatial and temporal limits and react to rapidly changing circumstances. The current pace of technological developments lends urgency to the consideration of legal humanitarian ethical implications of these weapons. Compliances of autonomous weapon system with IHL. Based on the state of current and foreseeable robotics technology, ensuring that autonomous weapon systems can be used in compliance with IHL, that is international humanitarian law, will pose a formidable technological challenge as these weapons are 
assigned more complex tasks and deployed in more dynamic environments than has been the case until now. Key challenges include whether weapon system would be capable of autonomously distinguishing military objectives from civilian objects, combatants from civilians and active combatants from persons RSD combatant that is wounded, sick and prisoners of war. Another key challenge is whether a weapon could be programmed to sense and weigh up the many contextual factors and variables required to determine whether the attack may be expected to cause incidental civilian casualties and damage to civilian objects or combination thereof which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated as required by the rule of proportionality. Likewise, the ability to program a weapon to cancel or suspend an attack if it becomes apparent that the target is not a military objective or is subject to special protection or that the attack may be expected to violate the rule of proportionality as required by the rules on precautions in attack appears formidable challenge. Thus, for autonomous weapon systems intended to use in context where they are likely to encounter protected persons or objects, there are serious doubts as to whether it is technically possible to program them to carry out the complex context dependent assessments required by the international humanitarian law. Rules of distinction, proportionality and precautions in attack. These are inherently qualitative assessments in which unique human reasoning and judgment will continue to be required. Now we will turn our attention to drones. The use of drones in armed conflicts has increased significantly in recent years raising humanitarian, legal and other concerns. Under international humanitarian law, drones are not expressly prohibited nor are they considered to be inherently indiscriminate or perfidious. In this respect, they are no different from weapons launched from manned aircraft such as helicopters or other combat aircraft. Drones are not specifically mentioned in weapon treaties or other legal instruments of international humanitarian law. However, the use of any weapon system including armed drones in armed conflict situations is clearly subject to the rules of international humanitarian law. This means among other things that when using drones parties to a conflict must always distinguish between combatants and civilians and between military objectives and civilian objects. They must take all feasible precautions in order to spare the civilian population and infrastructure and they must suspend or cancel an attack if the expected incidental harm or damage to civilians or civilian objects would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantages anticipated. Similarly, drones can in no way be used to carry prohibited weapons such as chemical or biological agents. Although the operators of remote controlled weapon systems such as drones may be far from the battlefield, they still run the weapon system identify the target and fire the missiles. The drones being used thousands of kilometers away from the battlefield does not absolve drone operators and their chain of commands from their responsibilities upholding the principles of distinction and proportionality and taking all necessary precautions in attack. Drone operators are thus no way different than the pilots of manned aircraft such as helicopters or other combat aircraft as far as their obligation to comply with international 
humanitarian law is concerned. And they are no different as far as being targetable under the rules of international humanitarian law. Now we will move on to the third challenge posed by the sexual violence in conflict. Sexual violence has been and to a large extent continues to be shrouded in silence. However, the dynamics behind it including its prevalence and horrific toll on individuals and societies have been progressively better understood over the last two decades. The fight against sexual violence in armed conflict requires a cross disciplinary effort bringing together expertise from diverse areas such as health, political science, gender studies, history, law and ethics. Sexual violence has occurred during armed conflicts at all times on all continents. One of the specific issues related to sexual violence is that it remains an invisible crime because feeling of guilt or shame, fear of retaliation or taboos may prevent victims from coming forward and talking about it. Material barriers such as security risks, physical distance and transportation costs may also prevent victims from seeking help. For humanitarian organizations that want to prevent sexual violence and respond to the needs of victims, this is a challenge indeed. It presumes that sexual violence occurs in armed conflicts and endeavors to provide an appropriate humanitarian response to the victims of sexual violence even in the absence of allegations. Sexual violence including when conflict related often has no relation to sexual desire but is instead linked to power, dominance and abuse of authority. While men and girls are particularly vulnerable, men and boys are also victims of sexual violence which may be committed by variety of perpetrators, state actors, members of organized non-state armed groups, peacekeepers, members of private military and security companies or simple individuals. Often sexual violence is not perpetuated in isolation but accompanied by other violations such as unlawful killings, child recruitment and destruction of property or looting. Sexual violence can also be used in a strategic or tactical way by parties to armed conflicts. In all cases, it has devastating consequences primarily for the victims themselves of course because of its negative physical, psychological, social and economic effects but also for the victims relatives who face possible trauma, feelings of indignity and guilt at having been unable to protect their next of kin. It may also have consequences for entire communities when it creates fear and destroys the social fabric. While the Geneva Conventions 1949 and their additional protocols 1977 may not be perfect in, other, in their approach to sexual violence, they provide the necessary protection from and prohibitions against rape and other forms of sexual violence. This is done in different ways. First, rape is expressly prohibited and second, the prohibition of rape and other forms of sexual violence is encompassed in less explicit provisions such as prohibitions against cruel treatment and torture, outrages upon personal dignity, indecent assault and enforced prostitution and those intended to ensure respect for persons and honor. Rape was already expressly prohibited in famous Liber Code of 1863 under Article 44. In contemporary international humanitarian law treaties, rape and other forms of sexual violence are prohibited in both international and non-international armed conflicts. In international armed conflicts, 
the third geneva convention of 1949 continues to provide that prisoners of war are in all circumstances entitled to respect for their persons and honor and that women shall be treated with all regard due to their sex the fourth geneva convention is more explicit and provides that civilian women shall be especially protected against any attack on their honor in particular against rape enforced prostitution or any form of indecent assault additional protocol 1 to the geneva conventions of 1977 provides that outrages upon personal dignity in particular humiliating and degrading treatment enforced prostitution and any form of indecent assault are prohibited at any time and in any place whatsoever whether committed by civilian or by military agents it is complemented by additional protocol 2 of 1977 prohibits in the provision on fundamental guarantees outrages upon personal dignity in particular humiliating and degrading treatment rape enforced prostitution and any form of indecent assault for all persons who do not take a direct part and who have ceased to take part in hostilities sexual violence in armed conflict particularly rape is sometimes qualified as a weapon of war and or as a method of war the characterization of rape as a weapon of war or a method of warfare are nowadays very common but these terms are usually resorted to in a non technical way to attach a particular stigma to the crime of rape and to indicate that rape is not just a by product of war that is not just committed incidentally or randomly but may be part of a strategy rape and other forms of sexual violence are absolutely prohibited under both international humanitarian law and under international human rights law thus the three important things drones sexual abuse or rape and also cyber warfare pose serious threats to the modern international humanitarian law